are back again, and this time I brought Paul back. Paul, welcome back. This is your, I think, your fourth video that we're doing on this Jerusalem thesis. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. So thank you for having me, Jay. <laughs> thank you for having me, Jay. Listen, it's, Paul, it's um, you're going to be saying things that are controversial. And let me, before people jump all over, Paul, let me explain what's going on. We have always said that we're not interested in the 9th and 10th century traditions. You've heard me say this ad nauseum. And that I would only bring people on board, people who are willing to actually ask the historical question. The historical questions are, where did this man, Muhammad, exist? The question, when did he do what he did? Where did the Quran begin? And where was this city called Mecca? We're really looking at the book, the man, and the place. The book being the Quran, the man being Muhammad, and the place being Mecca. Now, Paul's not interested in Mecca. We're not going to talk about Mecca. He, he may refer to something to do with the Quran, but that's not important. What he's really interested in is this person, Muhammad. And he introduced this, what he calls the Jerusalem thesis in the previous videos that we did earlier. Now what we're doing is we're now moving into a second stage, and he's going to do a third stage and a fourth stage. I've already brought Joe on board. You saw what Joe did, and he caused a huge furore with his claims <laughs> concerning the Sadducee element of who Muhammad was. I had Mel before that. Uh, we've already had Murad. I'm about to be bringing in Odon Lafontaine from France because I want to get these guys who are doing this type of material in the 7th century, and they are only interested in the 7th and 8th century, the, the centuries that really Islam uh, uh, originated or was created and they're only using material from that period and that's what we're asked to do as historians looking at names dates places events and also timelines we want to do that so that you the the viewers can come to your own conclusions we i've asked each one of the people who have come on board to do come to their own conclusions you may not like those conclusions and that's the beauty of youtube for heaven's sakes just comment and they will look that Paul has promised, so has Joe promised, so has Mel promised, uh, and so will Odon Lafontaine promise that they will look and read your comments. And the ones that are serious, they will respond to because this is how we learn. This is how we try to find out what actually happened in the seventh century. What was going on way down there in the Hijaz, there in Mecca and Medina? Well, did this man really live down there? Did he exist down there? Did he do what he did? Uh, did he receive a book called the Quran? And did he create this religion called Islam uh, that we're engaging with publicly? And I've been doing it for almost 40 years. Paul, you've been doing it for about three years now. And what Paul's going to do may be controversial. Some of the things he's saying today, you will not like. That's okay. Paul has agreed that he will take on any comers uh, right, left, or center, please don't hurt him, but engage with him. And we're not going to take trolling. We will not take trolling. If there's any trolling against Paul, I will throw those comments out. We want serious engagement because this is serious business. And the, what Paul's going to be introducing today is serious information. Having said yeah. that, we do certainly want engage. We do want the engagement, though. We do want people to Ref try to reflect on what Paul's doing, what he's introducing. I don't agree with everything Paul says. I'll put that from the get-go. I haven't agreed with everything Joe says, even Mel. And that's why I'm in some ways, I have the luxury of sitting back and listening to all these guys bring their different theories up and try to support it and then try to make sense of it. And we will make sense of it, but that's going to take maybe a few months, maybe even some years, because there's so much new material that's coming onto the plate. So now I've done my introduction. It's over to you, Paul. Try to convince us about this Masjid al-Haram and this Jerusalem thesis. Where did this all take place? Who were the main characters? Who were the main players? And how is it? You're, got, you're not going to answer this one today, I know. But eventually you are going to answer, how did Islam begin? Over to you. Right. Well, I'm I'm trying to build up gradually. I'm trying to start um, start with my uh, first of all with the Jews with equating the Masjid Al Haram with Jerusalem, because that is um, my first big idea. Uh, may I uh, may I screen share at this stage, Jay? 
Right. So very, very quickly to, to summarize what um, what um, I've said before and what others have said before. Um, there are many attributes of the Masjid al-Haram in the Quran that are shared by the Jerusalem Temple. The Quran mentions the Masjid al-Haram, it's very important to it, and he gives us various little pieces of information, and every single one of the pieces of information that the Quran tells us matches the Jerusalem Temple um, very closely. So, for example, um, the Quran calls it my house, talking in the voice of God, in the divine voice. And the temple is called God's house right the way through the Bible in the Old and the New Testament. The Quran tells us that the Masjid al-Haram was at a location assigned for Abraham, the station of Abraham, and it connects it with the, the testing of Abraham by the instruction to sacrifice one of his sons. And it tells us that this is where his progeny lived. Well, again, the uh, Jerusalem temple is at a place that is assigned for Abraham. Um, it is where Abraham sacrificed or was due to sacrifice his son. And, and of course, Jerusalem, more than any other city, is where one associates with the, uh, the progeny of Abraham of living, because it has been the capital of Jewish states and Jewish kingdoms over the, over the centuries. Um, the Quran tells us the Masjid al-Haram is the Kaaba, the cube, and the Holy of Holies of the temple was cube-shaped. Um, the Quran tells us that it was the, folk, the destination of a pilgrimage called the Hajj, and the, uh, and the Jerusalem temple was the destination of three pilgrimages, which are called the Hag, and the, the hard G. Um, often becomes a soft G when Hebrew words are uh, translated into Arabic. That's one of the learning points from the comments on a previous, uh, on a previous video. Uh, someone made a little list of all the hard Gs that become soft Gs from Hebrew to Arabic. Um, uh, Gabriel becomes Jabril and Gehenna becomes Jahannam and, uh, um, and so on. Hagar becomes the Hijra. So, so the Hag becomes the Hajj. And the Quran tells us that the, uh, that, that the Hajj pilgrimage includes animal sacrifice. Well, one of the Hag pilgrimages uh, is focused on animal sacrifice. It's a Passover. And the Quran tells us that the Hajj uh, involves circumambulation. It doesn't say how many times, but in Islamic tradition, it involves going round a cube seven times. Well, in the Mishnah, the uh, pilgrims go around the temple seven times. Um, it mentions head shaving. It says, um, you know, you will enter the temple with your head shaved. Um, and in Surah 48, this is connected with a vow that the people have made. And uh, the head shaving in the temple, as I demonstrated on the previous video, was part of the Nazarite vow, or part of the Nazarite oath, so that uh, people who take the Nazarite oath, um, when the oath comes to an end, they shave their hair off, they go to the temple, they shave all their hair off, and then they offer their hair that they've grown during the time of the oath as a promise, as a, as a tribute, as an offering to the temple. So a close association there. The place of Bakar, which is mentioned in the Quran, um, is symbolic of the pilgrimage route to Jerusalem in Psalm 84. The place named Marwa is very similar to Mount Moriah. Uh, it doesn't take any great leap to form the connection that Mount Moriah becomes Marwa in, in um, Arabic. And that was, of course, the very place where the uh, Abraham was tested and where the Jerusalem temple was reputedly built. The other island, Safar, um, it was where Odin Lafontaine gets the credit for, for spotting this, as far as I'm aware, um, that Safar is an old name for Mount Scopus, which is a hill next to Mount Moriah. And uh, Josephus, the, uh, the first century Jewish historian, um, tells us that it was on Mount Safar that uh, Jerusalem was surrendered to Alexander the Great. 
And this is, I would say, a story that is indirectly referred to in the Quran's story of Dulkarnain, who, of course, is, is, is modeled on Alexander the Great. And finally, the Quran talks about going between Safa and Marwa. And if you went between Mount Moriah and Mount Scopus, where do you go across? The answer is the valley between them was traditionally the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the valley of God's judgment, the place where God will gather all the nations of the earth together um, to, for judgment, which is the scene that the Quran itself tells on very many occasions. So I don't know how you would count this up. Uh, at a minimum, it's a six yeah, or, or, the, or the maximum, I think it's nine. But there are multiple, multiple connections between what the Quran tells us about the Masjid al-Haram and We're the Jerusalem now. Temple. I'm counting it as 10. So <laughs> we just started with six. There will be more to come. But the 10 that you have here will go with this for this for this episode. So that's that's uh, that was where we got on my first video, well, uh, my first interview, and since then I've looked at three other um, three other points that aren't necessarily the attributes of the Masjid Al Haram, but which pointed are in the Quran, which tells us that the Quran author was thinking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on his mind. Uh, firstly, uh, the Quran and Islamic tradition accepts that Jerusalem and the environment of Jerusalem is the eschatological landscape. It is where the end day will be played out. And one can tell this because the Quran mentions Jahannam 77 times, which is a version or an Arabic word um, originating from Gehenna. This is the valley where the wicked will be destroyed. And it intercepts intercepts intersects with um, the valley of Jehoshaphat so it's not a coincidence here the Quran is using the Jerusalem landscape to talk about the judgment at the end of days exactly as Jesus talked about get, um, the, uh, the, the 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 sinners being thrown like Darnel onto the fiery furnace of Gehenna and and just as Old Testament prophets had talked about Gehenna as well, that the Quran uses the same, the same word and the same landscape. Secondly, um, Jerusalem uh, had been the scene of God destroying an army with elephants, which is the story that the Quran tells in Surah 105. Um, uh, in, in the book of Maccabees, I, I explained that um, the Seleucid king had, uh, Nicanor, had besieged Jerusalem with elephants. And I think this is an illusion that the, um, that the Quran is making when it talks about um, the companions of the elephant uh, being destroyed by God. And thirdly, the very name Muhammad um, is a biblical epithet um, for the destroyed Jerusalem temple. It appears in, um, it appears in the uh, book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel's uh, wife, is, is compared with the temple, the, his dead wife. He's told not to mourn because she will be resurrected and not to mourn the loss of the temple because that will be rebuilt. And similarly in Song of Songs, um, the, the various parts of the fiance, her, her beau, her, uh, her lover um, is being described as though, being described as though it is the, um, as though it's the Jerusalem temple. So the name Muhammad would have been recognized by anyone familiar with the, with the Hebrew Bible as a term for the Jerusalem temple. So time and time again, the Quran is, takes us to Jerusalem and, and it's very much Jerusalem focused. That's as far as I have got to. Yeah. Good. Now you're going to introduce some new material. You've done a great job of giving us a review of all the videos you've done up to this point. I haven't even, I've kind of lost count. I think it's maybe been like four or five videos that you have unpacked all of this. So in some ways, it's nice to get this review because we have it all on one sheet. And I would encourage all of you who want to engage with Paul, grab this sheet, uh, print it out, go through it so that you are cognizant and able to take each one of these categories and be able to not only discuss it, but argue it, and then bring it and introduce it to your Muslim friends and see how they respond to this, because this is pretty damaging. This is very damaging. It situates almost everything we know of what, what the author of the Quran is introducing. It situates it not in Mecca, but way up a thousand miles further north in Jerusalem. Now